long as prosthesis have been around, people have been really focusing on making it look like a hand and move like a hand. But a hand is not just a grabber. A hand is a touch. It's touch that engages you with the world. It's touch that engages you with people. A prosthesis without touch is a tool. By giving touch, we're giving back a hand. I worked in a factory setting before I lost my arm. I was doing some cleaning under, out from underneath a shredder type machine and um, grabbed material that was in my hand and pulled my hand into the machine. I didn't think that I'd ever have the sensation of touch or anything back again. And then my prosthetist told me about the research program up here in Cleveland. They hoped to be able to give me the sense of touch. The research that we've been doing is reconnecting the man to the machine. Basically learning how to take what the prosthesis feels and translate so that the person using it feels it. For the brain to feel touch as being their actual hand, it's really important that we activate or stimulate the wires that the brain always used to get from the hand. What we do is we implant cuff electrodes and then we apply really tiny amounts of current that activate those wires and that information then goes to the brain. So we've been learning how to place this information on that nerve so the brain thinks it's his hand. They can feel not just buzzing, but also a touch, a pressure, like somebody putting a finger on their hand. And in fact, we've been able to see that intensity of the artificial stimulation mimics the intact hand. Um, soft, big block. The first time they put sensation on and everything, it was just incredible. It was like, wow, could actually feel an area in my hand, a certain area, tingling and vibrations and stuff. Small, soft block. I said, just an incredible feeling. Bringing the prosthetic home with the sensory hand on it and being able to feel and everything's changed life considerably. It's just little things that people take for granted. Brushing teeth to be able to hold the toothpaste and be able to squeeze and tell how hard I'm squeezing it so I don't squeeze it and go every place. It makes it a lot easier. We're at the point where subjects can use their prosthesis at home. They can have sensation while they're at home. It makes them two-handed again. It brings back their hand. It makes them whole. Usha lost her leg when she was two years old from landmine. I thought that I should do something for her. Dr. Terchai Chiriket is working with the world's first elephant hospital located in Thailand. Since it opened, more than 4,000 injured and sick elephants have been treated. I'm the first one who invented the artificial leg for the elephant. Using his knowledge as an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Terchai designed Musha's artificial limb when she was just a baby, accounting for the elephant's weight and size. As she has grown, pressure on the prosthetic has increased, causing it to break so a new one is created every few years. This is a challenge for me too. Every time we fix it, we, we improve it. It's more sturdy, stronger. This is all in the textbook. Sometimes try and error. When she obeys, we give her candy. And she knows where the candy is. She uses her trying to go into the pocket. <laughs> she knew. <laughs> I did operation on her foot about 15 years ago. But she, she remembered me. 
He liked to come closer to me. She showed a sign of uh, salute or happy. I think it means so much for her. She can lead a normal life as she should be. Sheep, sheep, sheep! Hi guys, hi Bubbles, hi Walter, hi Dolly, hi Mama, hi Baby, hi Albi. Janie's farm didn't start out with animals that were missing limbs. Mm -hmm. It just happened to come to her farm and she felt, well, prosthetic technologies helped me, it could certainly help them. I can't imagine not having an artificial leg because I lost my leg at 10 and I'm quite used to it. It's thanks to medical science that I'm able to live this normal life. And for these animals, I want no different for them. Hi, Felix. What goes on at Woodstock Farm Sanctuary on a daily basis, we're home to right now around 300 rescued farm animals. They've all come from bad places and they get the veterinary care, the health care that they need on a daily basis. Ah. Hi, Bess, just... <laughs> <laughs> She's feisty. Can you come help me with Felix? They're all actually in the front pasture. Little Felix came to us as a, as a baby lamb, and he had come from a big sheep farm, and overnight, some sort of predator had gotten in, and they found little Felix with um, his leg chewed off. And so I spoke to my prosthetist, the gentleman who makes my legs, Eric. Um, I don't know if many clinicians would have went out to the farm. I don't have any experience with fitting prosthetics on animals. Very few people in the country do. So I figured if I could take what knowledge that I do have and apply it to the animal, I could probably get them to utilize a prosthesis. And it wasn't until we got hooked up with SUNY New Paltz and their 3D printing lab that we were able to make something pretty cool and cutting edge for him. Seeing him walk on the leg was absolutely amazing. From my limited interactions with him, he isn't necessarily the most outgoing sheep in the world, He's actually very sheepish, but what he ended up doing was he started running away from us, which was amazing. We were just jumping for joy that he could actually get up and run, keep up with his flock. He looked like he was a very happy sheep. If we could do this more on other animals, we wouldn't have to, you know, put them down. Most of the world doesn't fully understand it. They think of them as just farmed animals, but we hope that that changes. And that's part of the magic of what we do here. They get pastures to roam in, access to the sun and to the grass. They live life the way they were intended to live. There's no greater joy. When I was a kid, I always played with Legos. I built cars, planes, motorbikes, but now I built an arm. Meet David Aguilar. My name is David Aguilar. I am from Andorra and I'm 18 years old. When David was born, his right arm hadn't fully developed. This is the my right arm. Well, growing up, it was quite annoying because I received uh, a lot of commentaries like oh, you don't have a hand or something like that. And while some would see this as a disadvantage, David is just a regular kid. He likes EDM. He goes by the name Hand Solo. Get it? He has an embarrassing dad. <laughs> he goes to school. This is my school. And he can open doors with his Lego arm. So cool. Growing up, he was obsessed with Lego. So much so, he wanted to make it a part of him, literally. I built my first prosthetic arm when I was nine years old, and I built it around my hand. It, it started being a boat. Unfortunately, the Lego bricks weren't strong enough, and it wasn't for another nine years till he would try again. This is MK1. This is Lego technique. It's like uh, the sophisticated part of Lego. I can do push-ups with this thing, so it's quite strong. 
When I first built the arm and it was fully functional, I went to the mirror and I was like, oh, oh, oh. That model, the MK1, only took five days to build. Of course, like any good inventor, he got straight to work on an upgrade. And this is MK2. It has a battery that works like a biceps and it has this fishing cable that ties up in here. When I fix this to my shoulder, I can do this. And the arm closes. I can stop in the middle and move it by myself. When I first brought this, they're all really amazed because how can somebody create a hand out of Legos? Uh, I was a normal guy and when I built the, the arm, everyone was like, you're awesome, you're, you're really uh, smart. They told me they are really proud to be, to be my friends. It's amazing. It's not every day that you'll see an amputee walking along with a peg leg and then begin to tap dance. My name is Evan Ruggiero and I am a one-legged tap dancer. It's fun. I started tap dancing when I was six years old. It's something that I fell in love with. I knew that tap dancing would always be something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. When I was 19 years old, I had a pain in my right leg. I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, bone cancer, and on May 21st, 2010, I had my right leg amputated above the knee. I was devastated. I just thought, how could a tap dancer be diagnosed with cancer in his leg? I remember my tap teacher showing me footage of Peg Leg Bates, who was a great tap dancer way back in the day. You know, had it not been for that footage, I would have never thought that I could tap dance again. When I put that peg leg on for the first time and I started making those rhythms, I felt a part of me that came back and I felt like my old self. I was able to teach myself how to dance again. I just let muscle memory kick back in and I tried not to think about making a step hop step with my peg leg, but just peg hop peg and changing around the vocabulary of the step. I perform in New York City. There's definitely been an audible gasp in the audience once or twice while I walk out on stage. Tap dancing is very personal. It's very much about the emotion. A lot of times you can tell when a tap dancer is happy by the way he's dancing. Despite having a diagnosis with cancer, I was able to overcome that and I was able to go back to the things that I love the most. So it's always gonna be a very different emotion that is tied to the art form.